with lots of activity. <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed the dinner last night and um, the talk from Phil. So today we've got a full program of papers um, and then of course tomorrow you've got more activity for those going to the paper pool. So I have been told this morning that the weather is not looking good for tomorrow. So pack an umbrella if you're going out to Burley because there'll be lots to see and do but it is in the open air as you know and um, so do pack your wet weather gear just in case um, what seems to be going to happen actually does happen and the heavens open. But this morning, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Adelaide, Professor Jenny Shaw. And uh, Jenny is going to introduce our keynote speaker, who's going to give the Ron Toranak address. And we're delighted that the Lord Mayor of Adelaide has agreed to speak to us today. And um, he tells me anecdotally that he, on invitation, said, yes, count me in because he feels he is amongst kindred spirits here talking about cars. So let me introduce Professor Jenny Shaw, who will um, uh, talk to us this morning as well. Um, yeah, pretty special, I think. Um, and I gather you're in for a really good day today, and Birdwood, of course, will be fantastic, depending, well, despite the weather tomorrow, I think. Um, but Jennifer said, my name is Professor Jenny Shaw, I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Adelaide. I'd first like to pay my respects to the Ghana people, the custodians of the Adelaide Plains, on which the campuses of the University of Adelaide here at um, North Terrace and at Waite and Rosewood near Village. Now it's my great pleasure today to introduce our presenter of the Ron Toronet keynote address, the Right Honourable Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Martin Hazy. That's quite a mouthful, but I'm going to stick with Martin. Okay. So, Martin has been serving the role of Lord Mayor since 2014. Before that, he founded and built the National Youth Works fashion chain, and he co-founded the Entrepreneurs Association of South Australia. He was also the general manager of the Rundle Mall Management Authority for three years, during which, among many achievements, he drove and oversaw extensive revitalisation of our central mall area. I lived here 20 years ago and it was quite shabby back then. It's really a very nice place to be these days. It's a great time to be a civic and community leader in South Australia and in his role as Lord Mayor, Martin has promoted and led strong entrepreneurship, creativity, technology and sustainability discussions and agendas for Adelaide. These have included the City of Adelaide's Carbon Neutral Strategy, Smart City Initiatives, 10 Gig City, which makes Adelaide one of the most high-speed connected cities worldwide, the City of Adelaide Cultural Strategy, Strategy Discussion Paper, and he has supported and promoted Adelaide's fantastic UNESCO City of Music status. And of course, he has overseen major changes to our city parks, our walkways, bike lanes and roadways. Uh, very importantly for this group, among his many other civic and corporate roles, Martin was also the chair of the Bay to Burwood Motor Inn. I'd now like to welcome the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Martin Hazy, to give the long time address. Thanks. Good morning all. Now I hope you can hear me <coughs> clearly at the back. Terrific. Um, Jenny, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Jenny, the uh, Dean, of Dean of Faculty, of course, Professor Jenny Shaw. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Harriet Edquist, uh, Chair of the Automotive Historians Australia. Lovely to meet you this morning, Harriet. Uh, Jennifer Clark, Head of Humanities, University of Adelaide. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, if Michael Neal, the Chairman of the Bay of Birdwood, with her, he's probably frantically busy in preparations for tomorrow, with any job. So, um, Automotive Historians Australia Board members, of course, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. And for those that have travelled from interstate and overseas, an extra special welcome, I must say. If you haven't been to the, at the City of Adelaide or South Australia before, um, I hope you are enjoying a wonderful time. So, the, uh, on behalf of my fellow elected members, I must say, and there was no exaggeration, um, when Paul Rees did ask me uh, to come and have a chat with you uh, this morning, I was um, 
the, the response was indeed instantaneous because um, South Australia has an extraordinary background, history, heritage, pedigree uh, with regards to all things automotive. And um, I must say I've thoroughly enjoyed researching this topic um, uh, and uh, adding to the knowledge that I, I already had. But I also recognise that I am amongst experts within this room. So, but um, I uh, was up early this morning and my wife said to me, where are you off to? And she, I said, oh, I'm off to talk about cars. She said, oh, not again. <laughs> so it's a, it's a long worn habit of mine. So, but uh, I did, uh, <laughs> was the chair of the Bay of Birdwood for about four years. And I must say, that's a magnificent event. And I hope you do look forward to tomorrow, for those who have not been to a Bay of Birdwood, um, <clears throat> a wonderful sense of community, a great rolling display of automotive art, I like to call it, um, but also a great recognition of history um, in so many ways. So please just immerse yourself in it. Rain, hail or shine. The Lord Mayor will do everything he can to improve the weather tomorrow, I promise you that. <laughs> but uh, it should be just terrific. So I'll share a little bit, if I could, before I delve into the City of Adelaide history and South Australian history in terms of automotive, just my own particular interest in this space. But it started very early and it probably started with my grandfather's uh, my grandfather had a H.G. Brougham, I think it was, which was a very flash Holden car manufactured in the late 1960s at the time. And um, my grand, uh, my other grandfather had a 48 to 15, of course being the first inaugural Holden model. So um, as a young child, I was kind of adoring those cars and washing those cars as young children do. And I think it started from then. And since that time, I've owned a myriad of uh, historic vehicles. I think my first vehicle personally was a Morris Minor and it kind of went on from there. But um, I've uh, been a member of car clubs, um, been a long-term member of the Sporting Car Club and I understand that you've been there or you had dinner there or you, in the last 24 hours. It's a wonderful building but it's a great club because it has such an extraordinary history. I think it's got something approaching 2,000 members. It was formed in the 1930s. Uh, and it could be the largest, well John Chickenborough probably know this, the largest car club in the Southern Hemisphere, I think, certainly in Australia. Certainly in Australia. So it's uh, got great history and it's got a great library. Um, you may have seen that, but that, that car club's got an extraordinary library. It's really quite significant. Uh, I'm also a member of the Jensen Car Club. I've had a Jensen Interceptor for about 20 years. Um, I've bought and sold many Classic cars mostly, not necessarily vintage or veteran, but classic, uh, over the years, but I've always kept that one. And every year I do a little bit to improve it. Um, before I go into the history, I do have a little story which I will share. I, um, I ran this youth fashion business, which at the time, from the early 1990s up until about 2006, 2007, when I was fortunate enough to sell it. The, um, but it was kind of the most hip and happening thing in Australia, or if not certainly South Australia at the time. And it was all things very kind of cutting edge youth fashion. So I was a bit of an anomaly, I must say, given what I drove. Um, but I had a group who were coming in for a board meeting um, at my head office on Richmond Road at that time. And there was the staff car park, and there was this very flash new WRX Subaru in the car park, and there was um, uh, my uh, ageing Jaguar next to it. And um, the, uh, one of the folks said, oh, I just adore your WRX. It's just a stunning vehicle. And uh, I had a chief financial officer who was a wonderful man, uh, extremely conservative. And in many ways, I was you know, wearing jeans and T-shirt for a decade at that point in time because of what I did professionally. And um, uh, in fact, it was his WRX. Uh, and this gentleman said, oh, I'm loving your WRX. And I said, no, no, that's actually, that's actually the accountant. It's mine as the old jag next to it. And I didn't believe it. <laughs> However, you know how these things get into your veins. So I've always enjoyed driving something with history and something with pedigree. So. But it's a real anomaly, uh, anomaly, I must say, because I'm equally passionate about the future of automotive. And I'll share that with about you. And it's a very interesting thing in terms of that, almost that tension, in terms of how we preserve and treasure what we've got but we leap into this bold new future of everything from electric to automation. It's a very interesting juxtaposition in that, I must say. So, but I will talk about that. However, 
but first. The city of Adelaide, interestingly, has extraordinary history. Extraordinary history. Um, uh, North Terrace has extraordinary history when it comes to Waterloo uh, on the Australian landscape. And when I was researching, I'll share a couple of moments with you, if I could. So, a French woman called Mademoiselle Sepele, I imagine would be the pronunciation, um, demonstrated a gladiator tricycle in Adelaide in 1899. And uh, that's generally I understand, and I'm looking to John, because John is an encyclopedia of these matters, uh, could be the first recognised sighting or experience of a, a motorised vehicle in, in South Australia, 1899. But of course that was built by the uh, locally built Shearer Stem car, of which John knows everything about, so I'm not even going to try, because we are within the uh, room of an expert. But uh, that was uh, first run down the main street of uh, a River Murray town called Nam. And that happened on the 5th of June, 1899, so very shortly after the first motorised vehicle, which was a tricycle, which was shown. The, but in 1901, I dug this out of the treasure trove, the Advertiser, the newspaper here in South Australia, could boast that Adelaide now possesses four automobiles, or as they are properly, properly called, motor cars or horseless carriages. Australia's first registration and licensing system happened here in Adelaide in South Australia. Dr William Hargraves, who was a medico who lived on North Terrace, was the first, and his number plate was SA1, to have a number plate and have a licence. So that's, I think that's great history. That gives us instant, I think, authenticity here in South Australia when you talk about cars. Because it all started here when it came to registration and licensing. By 1910, 1,350 cars were registered. And there was a larger number of motorcycles, of course, in addition to that. And if you compare and contrast that, as we go up to 1921, let's have a look. We were still leading the pack and we were comfortably ahead of Victoria in terms of vehicle registrations. The, and it's very interesting, it's wonderful, I must say, that you got to see Holden. Um, I'm sure that would have been something very, very special for each and all of you that you'll always remember. Because if we look at Holden's history, that actually started in the city of Adelaide. So if we wind the clock right back, the name Holden has been associated with Adelaide since, in fact, 1852, when James Holden emigrated to South Australia from the UK. And along with a junior partner, Henry Frost, in 1856, they founded Holden and Frost Saddlery, which was at 100 Brentford Street, which I understand would probably be somewhere quite close to where Border Place is now. So when Edward Holden, James, James' grandson, joined the firm in 1905, there was, always, there was already a family business, so to speak. So Holden and Frost moved into the business of minor repairs to car upholstery, this is early 1900s, and began to produce complete motorcycles with sidecar bodies soon thereafter. Uh, the, which Edward also began to experiment with fitting bodies to different types of vehicles, and different types of carriages, should I say. And James Holden founded the new company in 1919, Holden's Motor Body Builders Limited, specialising almost entirely in car bodies at that time. So moving then to a larger facility, which was uh, in 1923 on King William Street, Holden at that point was then producing about, a, what are we saying, 12,000 units per year. Now, we look at King William Street, and that takes us down to the southern end of King William Street, which was probably at one point in time you might know as the car cycle building, I think it was called. But prior to that, um, that, of course, was one of Holden's factories. Not the only one, but one of the early ones, certainly. Uh, and I went to Muirland High School, which was ne next door uh, to uh, the car cycle building, as it was known on King Street at that time. But during that time, during that early time of Holden, of course, well before the late 1940s, uh, when the Holden brand itself as a motor vehicle came into being, Holden Motor Body Builders was the first company to assemble bodies for the Ford Motor Company in Australia, which is an interesting time, um, whilst their Geelong factory was actually being constructed. In 1924, Holden's Motor Body Builders became exclusive supplier of car bodies for General Motors in Australia, and hence the association was started, with manufacturing moving out of their city plant to their Woodville plant at that time, which many would know. These bodies were made to suit a number of different chassis, 
imported from uh, manufacturers such as Chevrolet and Dodge at the time. But as they grew, um, Holden then opened another plant at Birkenhead in Adelaide, towards Port Adelaide, uh, which was constructed in about October 1926. Uh, and that was done uh, in conjunction with General Motors or Ford General Motors Australia. And that plant was built to assemble knockdown car kits shipped in from the US and the UK. And they were making about 35 cars a day at that time with a workforce of about 100 people. Mates included Oldsmobile, Vauxhall, Bedford Trucks, Pontiac, Cadillac, Buick, Chevrolet and GMC, which of course were trucks. So from starting as a humble saddlery store on Grenfell Street, um, Holden then of course grew to having manufacturing interests in of course not only South Australia, but uh, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria uh, and Western Australia. And interestingly, the as of course was the case that um, motor vehicle manufacturers and truck manufacturers during wartime came an extremely important part of the supply chains uh, of um, the war effort and Holden played an extraordinary role. So many women uh, were involved in building the Beaufort bomber uh, at the General Motors Holden factory during World War II at Woodville. And uh, Holden also made anti-tank guns during World War II, and the Birkenhead plant built boats during World War II, which were tested on the Port River. So by the late, late, late 1930s, uh, of course, when motor vehicle production had almost ground to a halt, um, the uh, Australian government was already beginning to think about post-war endeavours, and there was already very early discussions about Australia's own car and Australia's post-war automotive manufacturing industry. And Sir Thomas Playford, a former long-standing Premier of South Australia, certainly played a role in that, and played a role in that in terms of the establishment of Elizabeth, which was a, at that point in time, almost known as a satellite to Adelaide in terms of a sat satellite city. But the association between, post-war association between Elizabeth and Holden, of course, runs deep which of course you saw yesterday. But it was on the promise of uh, effective public transport, it was on the promise of affordable housing, and it was on the promise of work, employment, that Elizabeth was born. So the first New Holden, the 48215, uh, was birthed in uh, 1948, of course, and that was built solely um, in South Australia. And it was, it was an instant hit, that vehicle, and had quite a long waiting uh, list in terms of buyers, and uh, there was a great deal of, uh, of course, public support for buying Australian vehicle. In uh, 1962, um, the Elizabeth plant was then opened on the 20th of uh, October by Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, of course, next month, after 55 years, the uh, production lines will run silent, which is, I must say, for everybody, a bit of a nostalgic moment in uh, South Australia. Uh, it really is. I, I don't think we should ever forget that the, uh, what contribution the Holdens made during peacetime, during wartime, transport, automotive design, employment, economic development, whichever way you like to look at things, but it's made an incredible contribution to the nation, which is uh, something I think we should always cherish. Holden's not the only contributor, of course. Chrysler um, also has and had a rich history in South Australia, which dates back to 1884 when a blacksmith ma uh, named Tobias Richard started coach building, TJ Richards, and that was formed in Mitcham, in the suburb of Mitcham, which is not too far from where we are today. And business was brisk, as was the case often at that time. And he moved his small company to Highmarsh Square, which would be 300 metres from where we are right now. And uh, another example of the... Uh, and he's joined by his three sons. And uh, another example of the City of Adelaide's credentials and history when it comes to automotive design and manufacturing. In fact, at one point in time, I think there were 27 car dealerships in the city, and that wasn't that long ago. So not only from a manufacturing perspective, um, but also from a um, distribution perspective, uh, the City of Adelaide is, uh, again, uh, all things automotive have played a very strong role. And for those uh, who are from interstate and overseas, 
the City of Adelaide local government area is denoted by the parklands. So we are surrounded by some 900 hectares of parks and parklands around the city. And uh, the outer periphery of those parklands is our local government area boundary. And everything within it is called the City of Adelaide. So it's the CBD, it's North Adelaide. Um, there's a southeast corner, a southwest corner, an east end, a west end, North Adelaide, upper, up, upper North Adelaide and lower. So, but it's, um, it's really been the heart of things, um, I believe, for a long time. And interestingly, 2017, I think we're playing a role in terms of the economic transformation of South Australia in a very different way. But cities, as you know, must reinvent. Now, more, a little more about Chrysler. Um, in the early 1920s, um, Chrysler then moved its production to a considerably larger uh, facility on Anzac Highway, um, which is uh, the former Lacornu site, um, which is on the corner of Lever Street uh, at Truebury, and uh, Forestville, I understand. And um, that's a, a terrific site with great history. But during that time, various bodies were made by the company for mates as diverse as Citroen, Fiat, Maxwell, Oakland, Overland, Armstrong Sidley, Austin, Hutmobile, Durant, Amilcar, Rover, and even Rolls Royce. So, again, interesting history in South Australia. Several, several years later, after opening another factory at Mile End, this is Chrysler, the company also been, uh, began making uh, car bodies for American Chrysler Corporation for models such as Chrysler, Dodge, DeSoto, and Plymouth. And when the war broke out in the 1930s, again, as automotive manufacturers did, TJ Richards and Sons acquired quite a number of Australian <coughs> government defence contracts and did a lot of ammunitions work. After the war, the firm returned to motor vehicle production quite smartly. In 1951, they um, changed their name to Chrysler Australia Limited. And the last Chrysler, which would have been a Valiant, rolled off the production line in 1981. So, terrific form in South Australia. Um, and it, it's a story which I think we must tell. And I was really pleased to hear about there's an initiative to capture some of the oral history from Holden. Um, but capturing these stories and cap cap capturing this history in audio form, written form, um, for academic pursuit, general interest, whatever it may be, um, is very important. So I certainly salute you and the association and the work that you do because it's um, I don't believe that our history kind of helps inform our future. And our history kind of defines where we are today and who we are today in so many ways. I'll bring us now into 2017 to some degree because it does beckon a bit of a where to from now discussion. We have a very unique and interesting time because Technology is so persuasive in so many ways in terms of how we deliver information, uh, how we move ourselves about, how we manage and monitor our traffic. Uh, and there's this convergence in many ways between transport and technology. And you look at these associations between companies like Tesla and Apple, and in many ways uh, the marketplace is converging. But I'll start with Adelaide. Um, it's for those again from interstate and the cities laid out in a grid like manner. Um, we work largely off the same city plan that was formed by Colonel William Light in the 1830s, and it's an incredibly enduring plan. And if you are to at least try and wind the clock back and envisage the vision of the man who created the, the plan and surveyed Adelaide in the 1830s, he's extraordinary. Look at the width of Adelaide streets. Uh, look at that belt of parklands, uh, 900 plus hectares, it's about 940 hectares surrounding the city. Um, William Light was a military man, and there's lots of anecdotal stories about him, but they say that the width of the parkland surrounding the city is a little bit longer than what a cannon shot was at that point in time. So I like to call the parklands the moat. They protect us, protect us from the, all those pesky neighbours like Prospect and something. <coughs> and, um, the, I, I say that to Mary Lachlan, who's a very good friend of mine. Um, the, uh, it's a really interesting history, but if you look at that city plan, we are largely still working to it. 
it is fairly true. There are cities bound by terraces, East Terrace, South Terrace, West Terrace, North Terrace here. North Terrace is what we also call our cultural boulevard, and it is probably, I believe, one of the most extraordinary streets in Australia, if not the world, in terms of what's on it. Government houses and railway stations and universities and art galleries and museums and state libraries and national wine centres, botanic gardens, old Adelaide jail, new hospitals, Samory, um, beautiful heritage buildings. Um, there aren't many streets in the world that have all of that on one street, and you can walk it. So we are very, very proud of North Terrace, I must say. The, um, but that grid-like plan, interestingly, could well position Adelaide for a very different future. Um, Adelaide was the first city in Australia to have enabling legislation for automated vehicles. So just over 12 months ago, Volvo did some automated tests in Adelaide. And uh, our grid-like street nature actually is quite conducive to this more than others uh, around Australia. So when you look at testing new technologies um, uh, before they become mainstream. We think that Adelaide actually could be uniquely well positioned for a electric slash automated future, or at least slightly automated or more automated future. We don't all know how this is going to play out. We don't all know when this is going to play out. But we probably know that it will play out. And that's the important thing. So as a city, local government, uh, we need to be prepared for it. So and in doing so, we are laying out electric vehicle charging points in our city streets. We'll have 40 of them on the city streets by uh, June next year. Uh, and we're looking at our whole traffic management plans. It's very interesting. And therein, I think, lies the tension on that juxtaposition between, I think, what we all love uh, in terms of automotive history, uh, which is built, you know, predicated on the, on the combustion engine, um, and what could be coming. So I read voraciously in this space about where to from now. Some theorists will say that there will be a largely automated future that will be driving our older vehicles for nothing more and nothing less than enjoyment. And there will be designated roads for us to do that on, whilst other roads are for automated vehicles and automated public transport and automated this and automated that. Truth be told, I don't know, but there is a lot of information out there. It's very interesting to read it in terms of how this is going to play out. I think what we do know is that we're at this cusp of probably the most profound change in automotive technology than what we've ever seen. And it might happen quicker than what we've ever seen. Because if you really look at it since the late 1800s to today, the change has been incremental, um, not rapid just incremental. Automation probably started in the 1960s and 1970s with things like cruise control. Um, and it just went on and on and on. And now we have park assist and we have these, all these things. And when people say to me, oh, automation won't happen, I say, you've already got it. <laughs> I mean, that is the cold out reality. We've already got it. Um, many of us have got park assist in our car. That is automation. Um, it will just go to the next step and it will integrate more with technology as that happens. So it's a very interesting one, and I think the work that you're doing now is especially poignant because what we don't want to happen is as we launch ourselves into this brave new world surrounded by technology that we actually forget or don't honour or don't treasure or don't showcase, hence the Bay of Birdwood is important, for um, historic, vintage, veteran vehicles and their history and the role they've played. Uh, and we all look at this, I've learned from a different lens. I look at um, uh, historic and vintage veteran and classic vehicles through a design lens. I'm actually quite fascinated by automotive design. Others will look at it through technology advancement. And at times, these incremental in improvements to technology were quite transformational. Um, and often, as things do, they come from military. So it's really interesting. It's really interesting, but we must not lose it. So I think the work you're doing now is actually more important than it's ever been because we have this tidal wave of technology about to, I think, kind of sweep over the top. So um, full strength to you, and uh, it's a public narrative which we must maintain very openly, very loudly, uh, very respectfully, 
because so many people don't live at home, that's quite clear. Weather permitting, there'll be tens and tens of thousands of people coming out in Adelaide to watch that bay of burglary tomorrow as it rolls past the city streets and the suburban streets and through the Adelaide Hills because South Australians love it. They just love it. But if we look at South Australia's history in terms of automotive events, dating right back to the motorcycle races on Selick Beach, which was only, I think, reenacted last year and in years previous, the Lodafall Grand Prix, which is extraordinary event, again reenacted in recent decades. Uh, but many events at McLaren Vale, Victor Harbour, the London to Bright Brighton Run, we have our own London to Brighton in Adelaide, um, Bay to Birdwood, um, the uh, Adelaide Motorsport Festival, which will be held in December this year, of course Grand Prix, Clipsals, there is an extraordinary, and a lot of car clubs, Federation of Historic Motor Vehicles, which is the peak body, which looks after summer. 136 or thereabouts motoring clubs registered in South Australia. Um, South Australia is generally described as a storehouse of historic, vintage, veteran, and classic vehicles, motorcycles, commercials, because of our topography, because of our climate, and because of our amenable registration laws. So we've got terrific form. Per capita, it's always been said, per capita, that in South Australia, more people own these vehicles than anywhere else in the nation. So the challenge is to keep them here. Often they get <coughs> interstate and overseas, but the challenge is to keep them here. Um, and they're largely rust-free. So it's, there's a lot to be said about South Australia's place when it comes to um, automotive history. So again, as we look to the future, um, I've also been an active proponent for Formula E, which is Electric Vehicles Grand Prix. Um, uh, in many ways, that is the fastest growing category of Grand Prix in the world today. It's not the biggest, but it's the fastest growing by a comfortable margin. And I've been a proponent that if we are to continue our motorsport heritage in South Australia, a Formula E would be more appropriate for our future. Um, who knows where that's going to happen. So, thank you. Um, I'd like to just, again, welcome you to Adelaide. Um, you really are in the heart and soul and birthplace in so many ways um, of uh, automotive design, uh, automotive, uh, automotive manufacturing, um, and aut automotive development, history, culture. Um, you are in the heartland, I think, in South Australia of this nation. So a very special welcome to you, and I certainly hope you've enjoyed the balance of today, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the Bay of Burger. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, the Lord Mayor has agreed to take questions. So, uh, who's first? Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, uh, Martin, for a, a terrific, inspiring uh, speech. And um, I, I firstly might just preface my remarks by mentioning the, uh, the patron of automotive historians Australia, Ron Torelek, um, a, a wonderful uh, man, a great supporter of ours. Uh, we, uh, we named the, uh, the keynote lecture for our uh, conference after Ron because of his great contribution to Australian automotive design and engineering and uh, it's a real privilege to have somebody such as yourself here to deliver that lecture, so thank you. <clears throat> the, um, just looking to the future, I just wonder from a sort of policy point of view uh, how you go about trying to establish the, uh, the framework and the infrastructure for new technology in motoring. Because uh, I think in the old days, when people had cars and there weren't service stations everywhere, they could put a couple of cans of fuel in the, in the car or strap them on the running boards and that was their way of recharging their batteries uh, in those days. With new types of technology, uh, it's not easy to do that. You know, big batteries, transferring them, recharging them, and the role of government to underpin the use and take up of technology seems to be more and more important. So from, a, from your government, local government point of view, what are you doing to try and lay out the right sort of framework so that the possibilities of technology are there to be taken up? Um, thank you. That's a, I must say, it's an extremely uh, pertinent question. Uh, greatly appreciated. Just hold it down low. Sure. Okay. 
Um, we're doing a lot. The, uh, on various levels, simultaneously. So, and I'll start in no particular order, but first and foremost, if we actually look at the take up of electric vehicles in Australia, we're not a leader. We are a laggard internationally. Um, we are, last year there's about 1.2 to 1.3 million vehicles sold in Australia. The number of electric vehicles could have been measured in the hundreds. I think it was about 356 electric vehicles were sold in Australia last year. That represents about one tenth of one percent of all vehicles sold in Australia in 2016. That compares to an international average of somewhere between one and two percent globally. And the high watermark is Norway, which is about 22 percent of all vehicles sold last year in Norway were electric. So we are one of the lowest take up rates in the nation. It's an interesting. Um, uh, but we are one of the highest adopters of new technology in the world. Now that's an interesting tension. So Australians typically pick up new technology at an ex with extraordinary rate. They're generally viewed, and you'd know that, that we're looked at as a marketplace that adopts new technology quickly. Look at what's happening in the automotive market as technology, because effectively that's what it is. What's happening is technology and transport are now merging. So. It's an interesting one. So what we're doing in that space, we're at the federal government because the, the Lord Mayor's role is local, national, uh, statewide and national and international. The Lord Mayor actually wears a lot of hats of a capital city. We've been very uh, active working with federal ministers over the last 12 months because what we've modelled is that every uh, country around the world that has a above average take up rate, 1 to 2%, of which we are notably well below that now, um, has federal government intervention. They all do. Norway most particularly. They have very strong incentives. So the case about automated vehicles versus, sorry, electric vehicles versus traditional vehicles is actually one of price parity. If you could buy a Toyota, Toyota Corolla for the same price uh, electric that you could combustion, the take-up rate would probably go to about 35% overnight. So at the moment you can't. So it's, it's a matter of price parity. Federal governments have a role in terms of GST exemptions and luxury car tax exemptions and a whole range of things which can assist bringing the price down of electric vehicles. So there's, a relate, there's always a relationship between price and volume. We're doing work in that space. Uh, secondly, from an infrastructure perspective, for the city at least, um, we are looking to very actively position the city of Adelaide as the city that's got the fastest and most robust data network in the nation. We want to see Adelaide, because of its credentials in education, I mean we are a true education city, uh, medical, technology, professional services, innovation, entrepreneurship. We want to position Adelaide as the national leader in that space. And the infrastructure that all of those sectors look like, look for, uh, robust, fast data networks. And we're looking at a project <coughs> now which, for the South Australians in the room, you'll hear a lot about it coming through to Christmas, uh, is to position the city, the CBD, in fact the City of Adelaide, North Adelaide included, with a data network which is 100 times faster than the MBN. And we think that's the type of infrastructure which will attract a whole range of things, most of them exceptional. However, there's a strong relationship between that and transport again, because smart city technologies, of which every mayor on the planet is currently talking about, are all about using technology for transport, car parking, people movement, uh, open source data for entrepreneurs, um, s improving safety in cities, uh, reducing cost in cities by using technology to reduce electricity costs, a myriad of things. So. I guess in answer to your question, working federally from a policy position, working locally from an infrastructure position, and maintaining a narrative where you can take people on that journey with you, that they can actually, it's what I call the what's in it for me factor. So why are you doing this City Council? Why are you doing this Lord Mayor? What does this mean to improving my life? Is really important because technology for technology's sake is a bit of a hollow promise. It's got to deliver a benefit, otherwise why would you do it? So two things, probably amongst many I must say, that we, we are doing, but it's a very pertinent question. <coughs> Thank
thanks Martin uh, for such a great uh, insight I suppose in what uh, is going on here in Adelaide, some really exciting times I suppose going forward. Um, I want to pick up on a few things you mentioned at the end of that last answer um, regarding electricity and smart cities. Um, how do you see from what you've read uh, and who you've engaged, companies, experts, etc., on what this transport and energy nexus might look like, particularly around concepts of distributed grid, cars becoming the grid, those kind of uh, aspects of what might happen? Saturday morning workout. <laughs> um, thank you again, a good question. Um, the, the many parts to that, and I'll answer that with as much brevity as I can. Um, when the uh, City Council took a million dollars off its annual electricity bill last year, um, and there'd been a build up to do that, and typically city governments will spend millions on electricity every year. It's just a cost that we, 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 we have. Um, but we've managed to reduce it by a million, and how have we done it? Um, and we're an interesting local government because only 50% of our annual operating revenue comes from council rates and 50% comes from other. We own a lot of businesses, and we have for many years. It's always been a relatively entrepreneurial council, I must say. Um, we own car parks and depots and nurseries and swimming centres and golf courses and community centres and libraries, and some of these are income producing. Um, but we're now rolling out solar PV and battery storage technology pretty well on most of them. Um, we have had this incredibly comprehensive lighting conversion agenda, whereby most of our lighting, if not all, in our public buildings is now completely LED. Um, moving just simply from traditional light globe, be it fluoro or halogen or metal halide, to LED will actually take about 33% plus off your energy cost straight away. So we say, why wouldn't you do it? Um, it's good for the bottom line, it's good for the environment, it's like a win-win. Um, we provide incentives to our commercial ratepayers, our residential ratepayers. We'll give homeowners $5,000 to put in solar PV and battery storage technology. Um, we give homeowners uh, a grant to put in electric vehicle charging points. We give homeowners and business owners a grant to change over their light globes. So we, we, we first local government area in the nation to do these types of things. We've pioneered this all over the last three years. And the take-up rate is oversubscribed. We have a budget by which we approve in advance up to what limit we'll do every year, and every year it's oversubscribed. So there's demand there, clearly. It's a very simple premise. Um, we'll save you money, um, but at the same time, you'll help us reduce carbon in the city. We've also got a goal for carbon neutrality as a city. And again, that's as much about technology as it is, as it is anything else. People think it's ideological. It's not. Um, if you look at it through an environmental lens, why wouldn't you do it? But it's actually about new economy as much as it is about anything else. And when you can translate that to improved efficiency and reduced cost, people resonate with that type of discussion. It's practical. It makes sense. So we are... Um, What's happening in the energy grid, and this is possibly, um, it's documented, and it might be somewhat of my own theory as much as anything else, but uh, energy grids are localising. It's probably the best way to describe it. So if we wind back the clock many years ago, energy grids were localised at that point in time. They were state-owned assets. They were supplying electricity to the state. Then, of course, it nationalised through interconnectors and a whole range of things, and global players came into the market. I think it's just localising again. And it's not only localising, it's diversifying. I met with Bernard Salt, the de yep. demographer, which many of you would know, very learned man, uh, three weeks ago in my office, and we were talking about South Australia's energy situation. And there are lots of segues be here, bear with me, because there are lots of segues here between what I'm talking about and transport. Um, and I said, and I, I said, well, you know, doctor, what's the prognosis for South Australia? And he said, look, you've come under a lot of reputational fire in the last 12 months, but he said, I firmly believe that the state's actually on track. Um, and he said, it'll actually come out the other end looking very good. Because his view was that some of our other capital cities are only about to go into what South Australia is beginning to come out of. So he said, there will be more blackouts, and that, but they may not happen in South Australia, but they will happen in other capital cities. 
So he said it's all about infrastructure, it's all about the localisation of the grid, and it's all about the diversification of the energy sources in the grid. Whether that be gas, whether that be renewables, whether that be coal for now, whatever it is, diversifying your energy grid is absolutely critical. Um, we've also, of course, privatised our everything uh, in terms of our energy assets. And I think in some regard we're actually now paying the price for privatisation. Um, I don't think it's inappropriate for a government to retain an interest in essential services like energy. I don't think it's inappropriate at all. So the, we were promised privatisation would reduce costs and improve efficiency. Well, it hasn't. It's increased costs. That's quite clear. So the, it's a really interesting place South Australia's in. Um, now, what we now need to do, and I'm not the Premier, I'm not pretending to be, but what we need to do as a state together is translate that into re cost reduction because we're still paying an un unacceptably high cost for our energy. But those relationships between energy, grid stability, transport, automation and technology are all pronounced. They're actually quite profound. But we've got to link them. We look at these things in silos very often. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we do. We talk about the energy debate. We don't realise that it's independent, interdependent on a whole pile of other things. So I hope that gives a bit of an insight, but the, the general premise is there is I think energy is localising again as opposed to nationalising. It's maybe more a comment than a question, Martin, but um, I'm glad you mentioned education. Um, and engineering is not in my faculty, um, was in a previous role in a previous state, but um, I think one of the really big pluses we have here is also of the three big universities we've got here, all three have a focus on engineering and technology. And some of it's that fun stage of you know, building solar powered cars by, by undergraduates and racing them in, in the centre. But, but I think that also um, gives the state a real advantage when you have um, a real focus at the universities, but also in a lot of our high schools, um, on that, that, you know, where the future is heading. I, mean, I think the blackout as an incident actually focused people's attention on the issue uh, as a crisis moment. But it also, you know, we came out of it pretty well overall. And I think it actually, it, it, I, certainly at the university level, we had, um, I sit on the, for my sins, the Workplace Health and Safety Committee, but it actually focused attention on the whole university for how we coped and what we do in the future. Um, not just about transport, that was one of the, the areas that was horribly affected, you know, all the lights out, nothing moved, but, but also on where the state is heading. Nothing like a crisis to focus the mind, <laughs> I, I think. And we, I mean, we had one. It was, 12, it was virtually 12 months ago today. Um, and for the South Australians in the room, you'd know all about it, but it was fascinating. Here's an anecdote. It was very interesting. There were less motor vehicle accidents on that Wednesday night <laughs> in South Australia when everything was down <laughs> than there were on any other Wednesday night statistically, which is amazing which shows that South Australians are a very civil mob, that we, <laughs> that we look out for each other, and we're very respectful and polite. So there you are. I'll share that with our interstate guests. <laughs> so if you have a blackout in the future, look at that statistic. Um, but it was quite an extraordinary moment, I, I, I must say. But it did tip the conversation radically. I mean, we took a tonne of reputational abuse. Of course we did. But, um, sometimes from ourselves and often from interstate. But um, what it has done, interestingly, I think it's put an extraordinary sense of urgency into things. And I talk about this diversity. To stabilise the grid, you have to diversify the grid. So uh, that's, you can see the public policy. You can actually see the state now re-entering the, uh, the energy markets in South Australia. Uh, and you can see this being done with a great sense of urgency. Um, I was here yesterday uh, at the university talking to the uh, Adelaide Sustainability Association, which is engineering students. They have 970 members. This just shows the engagement with the youth in this place. It's extraordinary. Um, they started a year ago because I launched them. And they are uh, engineering students from the three faculties. They now have eight, uh, 970 members. So I would imagine by next week they're going to have 1,000 members. And they celebrate all things sustainability and how that relates to technology and engineering. 
and they had this entrepreneur they brought in from Belgium yesterday who I met and spoke to on Thursday uh, who pr provided some keynotes to the association. So I must say, the students are engaged. The students get it. It's just phenomenal. Their understanding and their interest and their, uh, their also their passion, but their interest and their understanding is importantly from an engineering science uh, and uh, careers perspective, I must say, because they're going to have jobs that we just don't have now. Um, there are going to be many jobs invented that you and I just can't envisage, but it'll happen, and it'll happen quickly. So there's a lot of engagement. I, I, it sounds like a cliche, but I generally think we're in an extraordinarily exciting time. But as a historic motoring buff, and as actually as a heritage buff, I am both, um, I'm just incredibly no, what's the word? I'm incredibly passionate about making sure those two things are not lost. As we, I, I think we're on the greatest profound tipping point of change that we've ever seen. Um, but as long as we don't just abandon some of the wonderful things that have actually got us to this point, and that's my mantra, which I share with a lot of people. Um, I, I'm deeply passionate about heritage architecture and the preservation of heritage. South Australia and City of Adelaide has the most heritage listed places virtually anywhere. Um, the city right here has 27% of the state's heritage listed stock. And we can modernise, we can have data networks, we can create new jobs, we can innovate, we can do all these wonderful things, but we don't need to knock stuff down to do it all the time. Um, the same analogy for our historic vehicle movement, because it's a movement, um, is I think equally important. So I think our National Motor Museum at Birdwood, and those that haven't seen it, is an incredible asset on the national landscape. So enjoy that tomorrow. Um, thank you, Martin, for a um, very interesting presentation. Um, more, again, more a comment and an observation um, than a question. Um, it's apparent from your language about these subjects um, that you're really talking about things that are visionary as opposed to things that are uh, complicated by politics. Um, inevitably, they always are when you mention things that you hint at politics by talking about reputational damage and so on. Um, and again, just by way of observation, whatever stage the rest of the country is at in terms of going through this um, evolutionary process or perhaps revolutionary, there will obviously be a lot more politicking. There will be a lot more complaining from the, from the gallery, you know, public gallery and so on. Um, but ultimately, we need visionary thinking to bring us out the other side. And I guess if anything's commented on these days about our political debate, it's the lack of visionary thinking. Um, no better example being the paralysis about the future of Australia's energy needs, um, where politicians tend to be too scared to speak their minds lest they um, suffer internal party damage um, from the left or the right of their party. Yeah. Thank you. It's an interesting one. Um, the, the, the energy debate has become so extraordinarily politicised. But I, I think a lot of people can actually just see straight through the self-interest. Um, the, that's, I think, abundantly apparent. However, um, it's interesting in terms of a mayor's job in all of this. Um, the uh, mayors are typically, well, I'm certainly not, um, uh, kind of signed to a party in any capacity. And I must say it's quite cathartic, but it just gives me this extraordinary freedom um, to talk about the issues for what they are. Um, uh, I don't necessarily preach them. I don't want to preach them. I don't see that as my job, but I'd like to communicate them. Uh, and um, I talk... Yesterday I spoke to the Premier twice and I spoke to the le Leader of the Opposition once. And it's not uncommon. I've talked to both gentlemen frequently and we focus on the issues. Um, so I guess I'm not constrained by that party politic in that regard. So it gives mayors, and it's not just me, it's every mayor around the nation, it's every Lord Mayor in Australia and many mayors around the world. Um, but the certainly South Australian local government system is not overly party, party politicised. Uh, in other states in Australia you do, you do run on a party ticket you can run on a party ticket. Um, that's not something which is common in South Australia at all. Um, in many ways, the South Australian electorate doesn't like it. 
So uh, many people in local government run in a kind of independent capacity, I guess. So, and my background was really that of an entrepreneur. So I look at life that way. An entrepreneur with an interest in history. It's the very easiest way to sum me up, I think. So, but it, it, it's how that public conversation is managed um, in, in terms of some of these quite complex issues. Uh, and I guess with my commercial background, um, I always find the only way to discuss something with anyone, whether they agree with you or whether they support what you're saying, is to answer the, answer the benefits question. Because if people don't see a benefit in something, they're not going to listen to it, they're not going to adopt it, they're not going to buy into it, they're certainly not going to purchase it. Um, so I think things just need to be in a very clear benefits manner. But I certainly acknowledge that matters like energy especially, is not the only one, um, are in a convoluted political space. And you just watch the national discourse, it keeps bouncing from, you know, by degrees to this side to that side and it keeps moving and it's, it's, it's all political manoeuvring. Try and see through all of that would be my greatest advice and just look at the issues, read independently, look at what experts and academics and politicians and community leaders are saying, uh, look what entrepreneurs are saying, look what other countries are doing, try and find a best practice um, and form your own view. And then go and share that with your local politician because it's, um, uh, it's, I think we've got great opportunity. We just need to get the narrative right and I think until we get the narrative right, we actually won't find the solutions because no one will buy into them and the politicians will be too scared to adopt them. So. We probably have time for one more question, if there is one. Yeah. I, I don't envy you your task between the two conflicting parties the one side of which says keep the motor car out of the city centre because it is choking it up and people will not use public transport if you make it too easy to bring the motor car in. On the other hand, if you make it too hard for people to bring a motor car in, the city centre of Adelaide is going to die because not, there will not be enough <coughs> support for the retail and people will simply go to the suburban shopping centres and the city of Adelaide suffers. Now, I don't envy you your, your task in trying to balance these. How, how do you get on with it? I must say that question is a hole in one because it strikes to the very core of my existence in this role. There is that perennial tension. However, uh, and I think I'd been elected 24 hours when that question was posed to me. It was certainly posed to me in 2014 on the campaign trail, but um, internally it was put to me. Um, I'm not of the mantra, the motor vehicle is evil, it must be banned from city centres. I actually don't buy into that. Um, the if, if we were to arbitrarily ban motor vehicles in the city centre of Adelaide uh, without a better plan, because my view is you don't ever do anything unless you've got a better plan to replace it. You just don't do something on ideological grounds because you think that's the thing to do. So the, uh, I think the city would suffer irrevocably and it would be immediate. Now, what's the better plan? That begs the question. Uh, people will look at uh, motor vehicles in CBD, densely, uh, you know, uh, uh, populated or uh, pedestrianised urban environments through a few lenses. Some will look at it through an environmental lens, some will look at it through a safety lens, and they're typically the things. Now, entree electric vehicles. If electric vehicle, and entree in, in many ways automated vehicles, I think electric vehicles are simply a segue to automation. That, that's what they are. That's how I'd encourage you to look at them. It, it's, once we get to a position where we've got wide or wider scale adoption of electric vehicles in Australia, I think you'll see the automation kind of discussion, um, if not outcome, accelerate. I'm not saying you can't have one without the other, but you're, not, you're, li you're a lot more likely to have one with the other. So, now, if you look at uh, uh, or uh, lots of cars in the city through an environmental lens, or you get to fix that straight away with electric vehicles. 
in terms of carbon emissions. So, uh, or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, so which are typically better for buses and uh, transport, uh, uh, public transport mechanisms which are travelling a greater distance. So, and I think the state is actually buying a fleet of hydrogen fuel cell public buses. I'm not sure if everyone's aware of that in South Australia, but I think that's something they're either contemplating or they've actually done. So, the um, environmentally or carbon reduction wise, it can be fixed. It's not about the car, it's how the car is powered. That's the simple proposition. Secondly, if you then look at um, uh, the, the, the discussion about safety, well, in many ways, um, automation in all probability will solve that too. So you'll have less emissions, and interesting, you'll have less noise, it's something a lot of people don't talk about. But when you walk down King William Street or Collins Street in Melbourne or Pitt Street in Sydney or wherever you're going, um, is the noise of buses is quite extraordinary sometimes, especially you know, when you're on your telephone or whatever you're doing, you, can't, you can hardly hear. Um, you go into hydrogen fuel cell buses and the like and electric buses and so forth, and the noise factor just drops exponentially to nothing except tyre noise. So, um, you know, noise pollution is a form of pollution. So, I, I, can, I drive a Jensen Interceptor, I can say that with great authority. <laughs> <laughs> it's the loudest car in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, however, the, so I, I think again uh, that it's not about arbitrarily saying cars are bad, they're evil, they must be bad. I don't, actually don't buy into that at all. I think it's about how they're powered um, invariably will change radically. Um, and I'm, kind of, I'm on the view we should be quite respecting in terms of how people want to get around the place. Um, uh, transport is important in the mix. We've been great advocates of tram extensions in Adelaide and there's going to be one coming down North Terrace. Um, they've started work and will be finished by Christmas, if not early next year. Trams are very, very popular. Um, but you need a multimodal system when it comes to transport, and that's the bottom line. And cars need to be part of that. So let's just solve the problems. Let's solve the pollution problem, the noise problem, and the safety problem, and you can do it all with technology and a different method of powering them. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of this session. Um, let me thank you very much for your contribution to our conference this morning. When we initially thought about a theme of heritage, we obviously were thinking about the closure of Holden, which is going to have a big impact on the City of Adelaide and the State of South Australia and the nation as a whole, and that was at the forefront of our mind. And also because the conference was jointly organised between the University of Adelaide and the National Motor Museum at Birdwood, and clearly the museum there is a great um, storage and uh, conservator and displayer of automotive heritage for the nation. So this was in our mind. But clearly today you have shown us that heritage is not a static concept. It is actually relational and that heritage is connected to the present and it is very much also collect, connected to the future. And that's an important addition to our deliberations and although we are obviously concentrating on the heritage of the past, it must always be seen in connection with the present and with the future. And for reminding us of that very important relational uh, connection, I want to thank you very much for delivering the Ron Toranak address here today at the second National Conference of Automotive Historians Australia. So thank you very much.